just going to preach for us and pray for you this morning. And uh, looking forward to what you've got to preach for us this morning. If you're a young person here, I want you to listen. Teenager, older person. But especially, um, this is for me. I need this. And so the Lord's brought me here to preach to myself, and you all get to listen. Psalm 19, let's read there together. And if you'd like to stand, you can. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day uttereth speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line is going out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them hath he set a tabernacle for the sun, which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, and rejoiceth as a strong man to run a race. His going forth is from the end of the heaven, and his circuit unto the ends of it, and there is nothing hid from the heat thereof. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is thy servant warned, and in keeping of them there is great reward. Who can understand his errors? Cleanse thou me from my secret faults. Keep back thy servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then shall I be upright, and I shall be innocent from the great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength. And my Redeemer, dear Heavenly Father, thank you for your word this morning. Even as we read it, dear Lord God, we're in all of it. Dear Lord God, it, it humbles us, Father, that we have heavenly writ, Lord, to open and from to read from. Lord God, help us not only to be hearers of your word, but doers. God, I pray you bless this, the preaching this morning. Lord God, use this message, dear Heavenly Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's look at the scripture just for a minute. You can have a seat. The Bible says, first of all, the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament showeth his handiwork. And then it continues on talking about creation. It says, day unto day uttereth speech and night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line is going out through all the earth and their words to the end of the world in them. Now he says all that to say this, in them hath he set a tabernacle for the sun. Now he's going to talk about the sun for a minute. He says the, about the sun, which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber and rejoiceth as a strong man to run a race. Then it says in verse 6, his going forth is from the end of the heaven and his circuit unto the ends of it, and there is nothing hid from the heat thereof. And then it says... Next of all, after we're done talking about the sun and how the, the sun comes out in his strength and you can't hide from the sun. This, is, this past summer has been the third hottest summer on record. If you feel like it's been hot, it's because it's been hot. Amen. And it's been hot and humid and muggy. And, and, and if you don't, if you're ever out in that, if you could ever turn the air conditioner off long enough and get out in that, you'll appreciate a thing called shade. And the reason why shade feels so good is because it hides us for a moment from the heat of the sun. You also appreciate a thing called the breeze when, it does, when it's not present. But the breeze cools us from the light of the sun. But it doesn't, it doesn't stop the sun from shining. Once you get back out in the sun, you begin to sweat again. Or for fancy folks, perspire. Yeah, Curtis, I'll, I'll, you're a fancy looking fella. And uh, for people like you, you begin to perspire. But the rest of us common people, when we're out in the heat of the sun, we immediately, we can stand still and sweat because of the heat of the sun. The breeze blows and it cools a little bit, but the sun still shines. You can't hide from the sun. It's interesting that God talks about the sun and he talks about how it encompasses and covers and, and warms his whole creation. And he goes immediately from the light of the sun and the heat of the sun 
to something else. Look what he goes to next. He goes to next of all in verse number seven, the law of the Lord. So there are no coincidences in the Bible. When you read the Bible and you read the Bible in context, God didn't just throw words together in places. Everything is for a purpose. And so in this chapter, this short chapter of 14 verses, we see, first of all, speaking about creation and about the sun. The sun is the star of creation. I, I don't mean star as in light, but I mean the star, the all-star, the MVP. Without the sun, we die. Uh, not to get off on a rabbit trail, but just to taste a little bit of one. That's why these transhumanist fools and so forth, uh, like, uh, oh, what's his name? Uh, what is it? The, uh, the Windows guy, Microsoft guy, what's his name? Gates. Gates, Gates. That's why they're trying to create an artificial world where we can live without the sun. They've decided, and this is no coincidence, they've decided the sun is our enemy. That's why you hear about the sun all the time and about, about being disturbed, kept from the UV rays and all those things. The sun is not our enemy. Without the sun, we die. Plants require photosynthesis, photosynthesis which is a requirement of the sun. That's where they, they have to have the sun to grow. So we have this society today. They say, well, we're going to eliminate the sun. That, uh, uh, what's his name? I just meant to go. I just said Gates. Is that his name? It's good to forget those fools' names. Amen. That, that's why he's uh, working on a thing where he used Pepto-Bismol, basically the same stuff that they put in Pepto-Bismol, to create a cloud that goes up into the sky to test to see whether or not he can protect us from the sun. Those, those, the, there's a reason why the Bible calls them fools. The fool said in his heart, there is no God. So they're going to create this world where we create our own food and our own environment and our own sustainability because we don't need the sun. But they're, they're, we do need the sun. Without the light of the sun, we'll die. We have to have the sunlight. Amen? Why? Because the sun is the heat of the sun is what drives out impurities and rottenness. You say, I like to sit in the shade and sulk. Well, in the, in the shade is where things called mushrooms grow, amen? And in those, type, those types of things and defilement. But the sun cleanses all that. It dries all that up. Well, just like the light of the sun, the, the creation requires sunlight. We require what's next. Without what's next, we become impure. I want to speak this morning about purity, not because I think you need it, but because I know I need this message about purity. The light of the sun uh, helps to keep things from, uh, from, uh, uh, from corrupting. And the next thing the Bible says, this, verse number seven, the law of the Lord is perfect. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. It's talking about a change. The purpose of this book is not so that we'll remain the same. The purpose of this book is so that we'll change. The Word of God changes us. The Word of God transforms us. It's impossible to read the Bible without, without a change. It's impossible for the sun to shine on that grass out there that what the grass will grow. It'll change. Uh, listen, the sun shines, and so the Bible says that the, the statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. Hey, the sunlight, and, and it, it, the, the verse said there that it uh, uh, rejoices the heart. Man, sun, not too much of it, but sun makes you feel good. On a cloudy day, you look up and say, well, uh, there comes the sun breaking through the clouds, and, and you rejoice in that. Well, we as God's people need the word of God because the word of God is, the, is greater than the light of the sun. It rejoices us. Whenever this old world seems dismal and dark and gloomy, and it seems like there's no good news anywhere, and by the way, that's because most of what we hear in the world is bad news, but we open up the word of God and let the light of the Son of God, the Word of God shine through and it shines through to us like a light on a cloudy day and it drives the darkness away and it drives the gloom away and the reason why there is so much darkness and gloom is because there's so little influence of the light of the Word of God. So the Bible says that uh, verse number 8, the statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. Uh, the commandment of the Lord is pure. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. 
The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. So it's talking about the word of God. And then it says, the Bible says in verse, uh, verse number 10, More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold. Forty times, forty times the Bible references, forty verses the Bible references gold. Every time that God used gold, he didn't say just go grab any gold. He said, I want pure gold. Overlay it with pure gold. Almost a hundred times the word pure gold, the words pure gold are in the Bible. Forty different verses you'll find pure gold. God didn't say just give me gold. He said, I want pure gold. The Bible says here that the word of God is, uh, uh, is, is uh, more to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold. Now, I don't know right now, but it, gold averages about $1,200 to $1,500 an ounce. Man, who wouldn't like to have a few ounces of gold right now? Amen. A, 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 an ounce of money ain't worth much. Amen. But an ounce of gold is worth a whole lot of money in our currency, in our world, which we live in. If you want to find out how little value there is in your money, weigh it against the weight of gold. Amen. So the Bible says here that it's worth more than much fine gold. And then it says sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. It's an amazing thing that God uses a reference to honey here. Honey, it's impossible, basically impossible for honey to be impure. You could, you could, wipe, you could take honey and dump it out on a rock. And the five-second rule doesn't account, doesn't apply to it. Honey, honey will not, basically will not go impure. You can find honey somewhere stored away, maybe two or three hundred years old, and you could still eat it. It doesn't, it doesn't get bacteria. It, it is kind of a bacteria, but it's, it's different than anything else in nature. It, it will not, it can make that which is impure and honey can actually reverse the effect of impurity and can make, make it pure. I had to have a surgery a few years ago and I, but right before the surgery, I made the mistake of talking to a fella at the funeral home. And this fellow was walking around, and, and he was all lame, and his knees were bad. And I, I said to him his name, I, and I called him by his name, and I said, why don't you have surgery? And he said, man, I'm afraid. I said, well, I don't care much for surgery either. He said, no, it's not the surgery that worries me. He said, we, we work in the funeral home, and he said, we get all these bodies in there and all these people with diseases and, and all these things that they contracted in the hospital, and there's not even names for any of it. I mean, they just went into the hospital, and they got some kind of a, a, of a, of a, of a bacteria or some kind of a sickness, and they died from it. He said, I'm afraid to go in there. And I said, man, you got me thinking now. I'm not too keen on that stuff. There, they used to be allowed to use bleach in hospitals, but they don't use it much anymore. So you can get staph infection, and staph infection is just a word to explain a whole bunch of other infections or bacteria that you can get in the hospital. That's how you say well, you're not encouraging me. Well, that's not very encouraging. So I had to have this surgery coming up. And so for weeks leading up to it, it was a minor surgery, but I got me a bunch of honey and I just started eating honey. I wanted to fill my blood full of honey and my veins and my body full of honey. I said, I'm going to be a bacteria fighting machine when them rascals cut on me because I don't want whatever they got to stick with me. Amen. I don't know if that helps or not, but scientifically it should have made a difference. But you can take honey on a wound on your body and the right kind of honey will actually cure and help with that. Now, God knows that. Much more than I can explain it to you, you can figure it out. But God talks about it and it says here that, uh, uh, that uh, verse number 10, more to be desired are they than gold, uh, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Now, verse 11, we're talking about the word of God. It says, moreover, by them is thy servant, what? Who's warned? The servant. The servant of God is warned. Now, it means something to me, and I think it means something to all of us here. We want to be used of God. You, got, you folks start, you started the church there. When you, when you do that, you pray and you say, God, I, I don't know anybody here. And I don't really, I don't really, this is not easy. Amen. And if you're going to do this, God, you're, it's, if this is going to be done, God, you have to do it. 
God, here I am as your servant. I avail myself to you. And God, I put myself on the altar. God, would you use me? And we pray those prayers like that. And we ought to pray those prayers whenever we, uh, it's one thing to give myself to God. It's one thing to say, God, here I am. I'm your servant. But if I am the servant of God, I want God to use me. I mean, we hear the piano playing and, and the, the, the heartbeat of the pianist in the church is God use me. God help this song. Help me, dear God, to be a blessing. And the soloist comes and sings and they pray, God use me. God help me to be a blessing. God, don't let this be just another song. And the preacher comes and he ought to be praying, God use me. God let this message take hold in somebody's heart. God let this affect somebody. Let some young man hear this message and, and their life be changed or some young lady hear this message and her life be changed and God let them be kept from destruction and from the filthiness and the corruption of this world by them is thy servant warned I'm not I'm telling you that the word of God gives us warning about how not to be ineffective the world's full of preachers the world's full of churches can I tell you that the world's full of ineffective churches and the world's full of ineffective preachers. That's the reason why we have churches changing so much and creating a new dynamic. And they're trying to figure out a way to reach people. And we got all kinds of singers. And I'm not picking on them, but we got all kinds of different styles of music. And everybody's trying to figure out a little niche. And they're trying to figure out a way. And, and some of them mean well and they're sincere. And they're trying to figure out a way to reach their community. That they want to change somebody, but they're missing it. We're missing it. Oftentimes I miss it. If I want God to use me. I need to be pure. God uses pure vessels. God's looking for a pure young person. He's looking for a pure preacher. The longer you live in this world, the easier it is to become impure. The longer you're in this world, the easier it is to become defiled. We live in a wicked, defiled, impure world. And yes, we can say, boy, it's worse now than it's ever been. But every generation is faced with the reality of a multitude of impurity. The difference is with God's people, we're not supposed to be a part of it. We're not supposed to accept it. Just because everybody wants to go down there and play in the outhouse, and if any of you are like that, not me, we, we have church camp, and in the summertime, I listen to some of the boys come out, and, man, they want to talk about what's in the outhouse. I, not me. I, I, Brother Chris helped me. This, this year, I, I put off cleaning the, the toilets, the porta potties, but those, somebody's got to do it every once in a while. Because they get bad by the end of the week. Amen. I'm not trying to be dirty or gross. I'm just telling you, those things get gross. And people, you can watch people walking into them like this. They don't want to go in, but you, it's a necessity. So you try to ease that up a little bit. And, and we'll clean those things. And this year, I hadn't gone in there. Thankfully, Brother Chris had taken up the slack. And he'd already been in there before I got there. Amen. And I, and I, and I went in. But, but those little boys, it seemed, they're not like normal people. They, they kind of like the worse it gets, the cooler it is. And they like to talk about it. Brother, listen, but not anybody with a good sense about them amen not anybody with a right mind the little boys don't always have good sense and right minds there but listen uh, people don't come out and say man look what i saw look what i boy it smells so good in there you ought to come check it out nobody lines up and say let's go let's go get in line and use the porta potty and figure out how good it is no it's not an attraction but this world somehow or another has convinced people to be attracted and drawn to the porta potty the filth of this world is what gets the attention. The off-scouring, the garbage, those things. As young people, uh, and you grew up in a Christian home, and the devil says, man, you're missing out. You're being kept from the good things. And the good things, by definition of the devil, he doesn't explain to you that the good things are the filthy things, the defiled things, the dirty things, the impure things. But there's a reason. There's a reason why he wants us filthy and dirty and impure. Because he knows God can't use us that way. Right. Now God can do anything. God used Balaam's ass in the Bible. God can use anybody. And God may determine to use somebody. And, and yes, none of us are perfect and none of us are sinless. There's only one. And that was Jesus Christ, the sinless son of God. But the rest of us, if we want to be used of God, we're going to have to settle something. God's not going to change. God's not going to conform to the times. 
God's not going to update himself. God's not going to look down in America in year 2022 20, or whatever it is and look down and say, well, you know, uh, there's not a lot of purity left down there anymore and everybody, everybody's filthy and everybody's corrupt and everybody, his mind is indulging in the things of the world. God says, I guess I'll just overlook it and I'll just pick me out a dirty vessel and just wing it, see if I can get any good out of it or not. No, God's still God and God's still looking. For a pure vessel. He's still looking for a pure preacher. He's still looking for pure ladies. I know I'm talking. I'm going to kind of teach on this a little bit here. And I'm just going to preach to you. If it's okay what God's given me to preach. Because I need to hear this. But I'm telling you. We need to understand what God talks about. When he talks about purity. He said here. He said by them is thy servant warned. The Bible says, and in keeping of them is great reward. I'm not interested in being wealthy, but I want God to reward my labors. They that go, he that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seeds, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. Anybody ever plant a garden? By nature, you plant a garden, what do you want it to do? You want it to grow. The growth of your garden is the reward of your labors. I hate to heal potatoes. I found out when I was really a little boy that heal, potatoes are a pain in the neck. Pain in your back too and other places. And I mean, potatoes grow. And my dad said one day, he said, we're going to heal the potatoes. It didn't take me long that I didn't want to heal the potatoes. You take a hoe and, and I mean, and you got to pull dirt up and you go up this side and then you go up the other side and you want to get fresh dirt on there so those potatoes have fresh dirt because potatoes grow under the ground. And man, I remember one time I didn't want to do that. I hid in my dad's hot car for two hours, almost died. I covered up in the back of his car and got me a bunch of stuff. I didn't want to heal potatoes. But if you get over that laziness and you'll grow you some good potatoes and you got to work potatoes if you want them to grow. I mean, you got to work at it and you think they just grow. I heard a fellow say one time that when his potatoes plants got big enough, he cut the tops off of them. They grew better. That ain't true. Amen. They, they need the sunlight that I talked to you about a little bit ago. That's biologically impossible to grow taters without tops. Amen. They need the sunlight to reach down into the soil. That's where the potato grows. But it, when you get down in there and you've done all that and, man, you sink that shovel into the dirt and you look and there's big old taters down there. And potatoes taste good. You know, you can live on potatoes. Did you know that? Amen. You don't ever starve to death as long as you can eat beans and taters. And the old folks understood this that in time of famine, all you got to do is grow you some taters and you can live. Amen. And so, but, but listen, that those potatoes, there's a reward. We live our whole lives sometimes and we never see the rewards. Now, when we get to heaven, you say, well, God will reward me for my faithfulness. And you know what? I agree with that. And we ought to be faithful. But we live in a world today where God needs some servants whom he can reward with usefulness. Man, I want to be useful. I only have one life to live. You only have one life to live. And the more defilement that I allow in my life, the less useful I'm going to be. No one goes to the sink and, or to the cabinet and uh, looks up there and finds them an old dirty dish to use. You might find some dirty dishes every once in a while in there. You'll look, if you're like me, you look down in there and say, oh, what in the world is that in there? Who washed it? What is this? Now, if you got good sense, don't whine about it. Go over and clean it up yourself. Amen. Maybe somebody was having a bad day and they missed that spot. Just go clean it. You, hey, you can clean it up too. Amen. But you, you got to have a warped mind. I was visiting a fellow one time from the church. And man, uh, I love the guy to death. But uh, I, was, I was at his house and he said, you want a cup of coffee? And I said, yeah, I love to have a cup of coffee. I didn't want it as much as I thought I did. He brought me a cup of coffee, and I, I didn't pay any attention. I took a drink. There's a reason why I look now. 
I took a drink, and man, I, there was something other than coffee I was tasting. And I looked, and the whole rim of that cup was covered with yellow stuff and cat hair and dog dirt. I mean, it was, I did not want any more coffee after that, amen? I, my coffee drinking was done for the moment. I was done. I didn't, I wasn't, there wasn't nothing, maybe nothing wrong with the coffee, but the cup that it would come out of was defiled. I'm telling you, by them is thy servant warned you say, I read my Bible. I didn't get anything out of it. That's impossible. Every time you read your Bible, you get something out of it. The more you read this book right here, the more you'll see your impurity. Just like the light of the sun changes things. That sunlight can't shine. It, it, it's a, it's a, it, it penetrates. It reaches down to the depths of the soil. It'll germinate a seed that's buried down there. And this book right here, when you read it, it reaches places where nobody else can reach. God, give us some preachers that will reach people. But if you and I don't read the Bible, then God will never reach us like he wants to reach us. Why? Because his book penetrates the darkest places of our soul. Yeah. That's what the Bible does. The Bible says, keep back thy servant. It says, who can understand his errors? What's well, the big deal? I made a mistake. No big deal. God says, I don't want you to be an error-filled people. You know, baseball, you can lose because of errors. They don't put an asterisk up there and say, well, they lost because of an error. So it's not, it doesn't really count against them. Most baseball games are lost because of errors. Those are pros out there. But all it takes is one pro to make an error and lose the game. The Bible says, cleanse thou me from my secret faults. Well, there's not much of that. Keep back thy servant also from presumptuous sins. I don't have time to teach on that, but that's, a, that's not an that's not a innocent thing. A presumptuous sin is when you know something but, and you allow it and you just let it keep on going. It's like that dripping faucet. It's like that leak in the roof, but it's not a big leak. And you let it go like I've done before. And after a while, the whole, the whole side of the house is rotted out. And I hit myself and I say, why did I do that? Why didn't I fix it? Because it wasn't a big leak. It was a little leak. Day after day and week after week, that little leak will destroy everything. Presumptuous sins. Listen, young people, listen. What is that? The Bible says, let them not have, look at that next word, dominion over me. You know what the devil wants? He wants... You know, the devil, just like God won't use a defiled, dirty vessel, you know what's the devil's favorite type of vessel to use? One that's so defiled and so filthy, he just has dominion over it. Almost what we call reprobate silver. God may not be able to do much with a reprobate, and I don't know what that is, and you don't know what that is, so we can't reprobate people. But when God says something's reprobate, he cast it out. But the devil said, hey, that's just what I'm looking at for. And the devil's got a world full of reprobates that have no use for God and no sense of understanding, no care for the Word of God, and they're mighty fine tools for the devil, but they don't realize they're under his dominion. The works of your father... You will do. They're actually his servants. There's no escape for them. They're not going to get free. They don't even hear the truth anymore. They're under bondage. The Bible says, let them not have dominion over me. Then shall I be what? Upright and I shall be innocent from the what? The great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be what? What's the word? Acceptable. Let the words of my mouth, listen, and the meditation of my heart be what? Acceptable. I'm not picking on the young people, but there's more young people here than us adults. But young people, you know, old people, I know, but young people, you know that there are things that you'll say to each other that you may not say when mom and dad are around. Or if you'll, before you say it, you'll look around to see who's around. And uh, that's, we do that as adults also. How is it that we forget that everything I say, God hears? 
But more than that, every thought, my, the meditation of my heart. And here the psalmist says, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord. And look what it says, my strength and my redeemer. He talked about the strength of the bridegroom coming out of the chamber in all of his glory and manliness. And then he talked about the sunlight coming out and shining and that man feels like he can conquer the world and that sun does rule over the world and God is saying to his servants, if you want to be useful, if you want to be acceptable in my sight, if you want to withstand my inspection, hold up under my sight, my inspection, and you want me to use you, you better be pure. Man, I want God to use me. I've, I've prayed that since I was a young boy, since I was a teenager. I, since I surrendered my life to God, I want God to use me. And I wonder sometimes, God, why don't you use me the way I want you to use me? God, what's wrong? God, why do you use that person? Or why do you use this person? And we think that, that way. And we don't, by the way, just to prep, we don't know what God's doing in our lives. Amen? We don't know. So we can't worry about this all the time. We can't wonder because God does different things with different people. And we're not to compare ourselves among ourselves because God said that's not wise. But the truth of the matter is we need to be honest with ourselves and saying, is God using me to my fullest intent to his fullest intention or is there something some secret fault something in me that hinders my usefulness for God let me just give you a couple verses here I could preach to you for a long time like the young preacher that uh, we were talking about that not a lot of people showed up on Sunday morning they had heard that this young preacher was going to preach and so a lot of people stayed home I didn't hear about a young preacher today, but they heard about me, amen? Maybe I don't, but that don't matter. But listen, the young, they, so a lot of people didn't come, but, but there were some people that came to encourage the young preacher, and to motivate him, and not to let him get, you know, to be an encouragement to him. And especially one, uh, one fellow came up to him, and he said, now, son, you preach. He said, now, he said, I got cattle. He said, now, listen, he said, if, he said I call my cattle down every morning, and he said, sometimes three or four of them come down. Some of them don't all come down. Maybe they're full on the high period. They don't come down and eat. He said, but I call them down. I feed them. He said, you go ahead. He said, there's a few of us here. Preacher, feed us. That young man preached for two hours. The old man went up to him afterwards. He said, son, I forgot to tell you part of that story. He said, if there's only two or three cattle come down, I don't feed them all the hay in the barn. Amen. I save some for later on. He said, just please, you don't have to feed us all of it. Amen. I'm not going to give you all of it this morning, but I want you to know that God wants you, Curtis. God wants you to be pure. The devil wants you defiled. He wants you filthy. I started to bring my other white shirt. I had Hannah grab it for me on the way out. I was, it was the one I won't ever wear. And it's got these little sissy stripes. Y'all, I mean, it's those stripes, too. And it's got these little stripes on it, you know. And I mean, it's just fancy. Not, you know, I don't, I, I mean, it's just, I'm, I'm not that fancy to wear it. And, and uh, I don't have any silk socks to match it or anything like that, you know. So I, I, I get that. I, I was going to get that thing. And, man, I, I wouldn't pull that shirt out full of, y'all ever eat spaghetti? You ever eat spaghetti with a white shirt? That's like a goal in life to try to eat spaghetti with a white shirt and not get spaghetti on you. And you'll think you did it. And then you look and you got a spot here and a spot here, especially if it's good spaghetti, amen? Right. I mean, uh, but listen, and you get that all over, and you think, man, just a few spots, it's okay. My jacket covers it up. I went to Bible college. I know how that works, you know what I mean? You just iron right here, and you look good. You put your jacket on and cover all that wrinkles up. But, man, that shirt's defiled. It's not much good. Dirty. Someone said once, a little boy ran in the laundry room and he said, Mama, is this shirt clean? It's his favorite shirt. Y'all know what a favorite shirt is, don't you? And he said, she said, you, if you have to ask, you already know the answer. It's dirty. None of us really have to ask God, God, is there any area in my life that needs some cleaning up? There's, there's, there is plenty of air. We live in a world that's bent on infiltrating our minds and our lives and filling us up with filthiness. 
The devil wants you to get to the place where you say, well, you know what? I'm so far going, it don't even matter anymore. I mean, there was a time when I had some sensitivity to things. And there was a time when things bothered me. And there was a time, actually, whenever I said, God, I'm sorry. But now I've gone so far, God, that you know, it don't even matter anymore. God, God understands. He knows how I am. He made me this way. I just go ahead and go with it. That's where the devil wants us to go to. Esther, you can go with mommy. You can go, she can go down there with them. That's all she wants. Listen, I'm not preaching because I think I'm a model of, of purity, rather because Jesus, my Lord, wills for me to be pure. The Bible said in Psalm in Proverbs 15, 26, I'm going to hasten through here and finish. The thoughts of the wicked are an abomination to the Lord, but the words of the pure are pleasant words. God's people are to be a pure people. Everything God has ever used consistent. He, it's something he's made pure. Someone said this, no man suddenly falls. Rather, the thoughts have grown accustomed to dwell on impurity long before the deed of impurity is committed. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. We live in a world of murderers and rapists and and, and all kinds of wickedness. And sometimes we hear that stuff and we think, how could someone do that? They didn't just do it. They thought about it first. Yeah. First, thing that, first time they thought about it, they said, man, you can't think that way. I mean, even lost people, those thoughts will enter in. And the old saying used to be that you can't, uh, can't keep a bird from flying over, but you don't have to let it build a nest. But that thought comes to your mind, and there are no real thought police, except you have to be kind of a, your own thought police, amen? And you have to kind of not allow certain thoughts to linger in your mind. You may not be able to prevent them from coming, especially in this suggestive, wicked world that we live in. But young men, those thoughts will come into your mind, but you don't have to entertain them, young ladies. You don't have to entertain it. The, the, the devil works just as hard to defile the minds of a young lady as he does a young man. Matter of fact, the more defiled he can get the minds of the young ladies, the easier it is to defile the men. But he says, and, and, and that goes for us as adults also. The thought comes in and the person says, I can't, I, how could I think that way? The next time the thought comes around, they say, well, and they give a little audience to the thought. I mean, preacher, we hear about it all the time. Things uh, in the ministry and preachers falling. And we think, how could he do that? How could a man throw away his ministry? How could he wreck his marriage? How could he do that? Because he let the thought come. And he dwelled on the thought one day. And he said, I shouldn't have thought that. But the thought comes back again. And again. And after a while, it begins to play out in his mind. It didn't just happen. He gave the thought permission to stay. Someone said the thoughts have grown accustomed to dwell on impurity. The, the thoughts long before the deed of impurity is committed. In pureness of mind lies our best defense. And purity of mind is essential to clearness of spiritual vision. And lofty exaltation of soul. The reason why we live in a generation today where we have a small God and we think great things can't be done and we can't have revival is because we allow the devil to defile our minds and we don't have a lofty vision of God anymore. That songwriter sung, How Great Thou Art, when I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds thy hands have made. Right about then, our cell phone rings or we see a dirty advertisement or something hits our mind. We think, God, if I could just hide somewhere, if I could just get away somewhere, and there are seasons where we do need to get away from it. You'll never, we'll never be completely out of this world, but we need seasons and times. I'm going to show you that real quick here before I, I get done here. We need times to separate from, from it, come out from among them and be a separate to me, say the Lord, and I will be a father unto you and you shall be my children. The Bible talks about abiding. There needs to be times where we abide, where we turn our phone off and turn the television off and we turn the radio off and we just get alone with God. You say, is it possible for a person to be perfect and, and not have any impurities? Not 
not so much so, but there are times when we can abide with Christ. The old preacher that's going to heaven now, Brother Frank Chapman. I don't know if you ever knew if you knew Brother Chapman or not, but folks around here knew him. He died. They they his, had his funeral during the COVID time and couldn't have it in per they didn't have an in-person service and they had a graveside service and we out in Alum Creek. We went to the graveside service and there were people lined up along the road to watch the body go by. We went out on the hillside where the funeral service would be held at the graveside. People everywhere in a cold, rainy day because God had used him to touch the hearts of hundreds of people. I'll tell you why God used him in such a way because he was a pure vessel. I'd see Brother Frank coming somewhere in the hospital and I'd start checking to make sure. I'd say, man, do I want him to see me today or not? He'd say, you want to pray with me? And I didn't always want to pray with him because I felt like something was wrong with me. He, he was no different than I am or you are. But he was a pure vessel. And God used him in a great way. We can allow ourselves to be full of excuses and impurities and, and just say, well, it's just the way it is. Just the times in which we live. God says, I'm looking for some pure people with a lofty vision of me. He said, be holy as I am holy, saith the Lord. And the beautiful vision of God should be man's noblest ambition, the person said. Psalm 119, verse 140 said, Thy word is very pure, therefore thy servant loveth it. And I like, I like good water, don't you? Sometimes we'll go in a restaurant and we've been mowing and it's hot. And I don't even care what the food is. I just want the water. I mean, just the water tastes so good. And, and I don't know where it came from. I don't know what all is in it, but I don't see anything in it. Amen. I just know it tastes good. But the word of God is pure. It's perfect. The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in the furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. The wicked walk on every side when the vilest men are exalted. I'll just say this real quick. I don't want any of you to ever, uh, to ever get to the place where you believe this lie of the devil and believe that this book is not perfect. It is the imperfect in defiled, we're undefiled word of God. It is without defilement. Amen. This is not man's book. and It's not just a translation. It's God's word preserved, perfect, preserved by God. Don't ask me to explain inerrancy and infallibility, but it is an inerrant, infallible, preserved book. Amen. It's God's word. It's the only perfect thing, the only inerrant, infallible thing we'll have on this earth is the word of God. But yet we, have, we allow men to stand up and tell us, well, now there are mistakes in it. There are errors in it. We ought to reject that. Not reject it so that we can have an audience of people say amen, but reject it for your own sake. Because you and I need to believe that it is the pure, perfect word of God. Amen. The devil wants to shake our faith in that. And he, he in every generation, every generation deals with the same thing, the same thing. Do we have a pure scripture or not? Don't, don't let the devil fool you. Amen. Just believe it by faith. Say, explain that to me. I'm not going to explain it to you. No more than I'm going to explain your salvation to you or your birth to you. I'm going to tell you that by faith, I believe that I have the perfect, pure word of God. And if I don't have the perfect word of God, then I may as well sit down right now. Amen. God, the devil, the devil, I, I could go to you in, in Ezekiel chapter number eight. God took the man of God, Ezekiel, and he said, I want to show you something. And he said, I want you to look. He said, look what the, he said, look what the people are doing. And he took them and he talked about a thing called the chambers of their imagery, what the people did in hiding in secret in Ezekiel chapter eight. I don't have time to go there. I'm going to tell you, the devil wants to corrupt your mind, and we have a world full of people that have been corrupted. Impurity is always with us, but we cannot ever accept it as normal. It's an agent of corruption. I'm going to say this, and I'm getting toward the finish line. In the Old Testament, how many of you ever heard about leaven and unleaven? You've heard of leaven and unleaven. You know, we get the idea that they were never supposed to use any, any leaven. 
That's not true. They use leaven. Leaven is what makes your bread taste good. How many of you ever? How many of you ever ate communion bread before? We made some. Y'all ever made made your own? Boy, don't people love that? I mean, I've had people look at you. What in the world? Some people come to take communion thinking that the leaven is supposed to taste good. I've seen people put it in their mouth, and and I'm just telling you, I've been. I'm a church mouse, man. I've seen people put it in their mouth and then go spit it out afterwards. And I want to, you know, you know what I mean. But but they're not trying to be unholy. They just say oh, it don't taste good. The leaven is what makes it taste good. But it's also the same thing that after a while you look in the pantry and the bread is green. How many of you ever eat green bread before, intentionally? May have eaten a little bit and then look on the backside, Brother Chris, yeah, oh, there's some green back here. I wonder how much of that I ate. But it didn't kill you. But it don't make you feel good. There ain't nobody says, give me a chunk of moldy bread. I want some green bread. No, we don't want moldy bread. But we don't want unleavened bread either. But a little leaven, leaven at the whole lump. And I'm going to tell you what, we get plenty of this world. If I, did, if I came up here and preached to you in, in one of them sanctimonious ways, and you think, oh, man, listen to that guy. He don't know. We hear someone preach, and we say, yeah, he knows what, he knows what I'm dealing with. That kind of preaching helps us. Because that fellow, he's being honest with you. He's being a little bit transparent. But then you can be too transparent. And that's not good. There's a lot of stuff here. I'm not going to get into all of it. But there were times when God said to them, he said, let's put away the leaven. Let's put it away. Let's put it away. There was a time whenever uh, 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 Jacob's house was going to be blessed, and this is a sad thing. But he said, all right, all of you put away your false gods. They shouldn't have had them to begin with. But Jacob said, we're going to get right with God. And listen, by the way, there's nothing wrong with revival and getting right with God. Nobody lives always where they're supposed to. Now, that's not an excuse when I say that. We're, we're, in air, we're corrupt creatures. We're creatures with leaven in us. But there ought to be seasons of renewal where we say, God, search me. See if there be any evil way in me. God, is there something I'm allowing in my life that's hindering my being useful? Yeah. Jacob said, let's search the house. Now, every time I read that, I think, man, why did you have Laban? Why did you have all that stuff, Jacob? Because he's just like us. He's like me and you. We allow stuff. The Bible says, happy is the man that condemneth not himself in the thing which he alloweth. I've been around some of these guys. Man, I ain't sinned in a hundred years. I've heard their stories. I've heard their lies. I know better and you know better. Fellow one time, mission men, I was preaching at the mission, and the mission men said, yeah, this one guy, he comes out here from the Pentecostal uh, church around there. He told us that if he'd have been there when Jesus said, let him that is without sin cast the first stone, he told us he could have done it because he ain't sinned in years. And the mission men laughed at him just like you are. They knew better. You don't tell mission men that kind of junk. They know better. Anybody with half a mind knows better. But there needs to be times in our life when we say, God, cleanse me. God, I want you to, God, let's renew this thing. God, let's get this thing right. The blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleansed us or cleanseth us. Now, as far as eternal salvation, it's settled. But His blood cleanses us daily. And we need to realize that. And say, wash me, God, clean me up. At camp, at our, at our at camp, some people don't shower. Kurt, did you shower this year? You did. Oh man, you rolled my illustration. I think less of you than I used to think of you. I mean, I, I've never known of Kale. Did you? You did too. Anybody not take a shower this year at camp? Johnny, I well, you you at home. Listen, I mean, but there, I mean, there were times. Where's Danny at? Danny's over there somewhere, and uh, I bet Danny didn't take one. He probably practiced the week before not taking one. I mean, listen, I mean, he's a true blue camper. But, man, it feels good. A few years ago, we had this thing. They said, don't use the water. It's, it'll defile you. After a while, I decided I didn't care what was in the water. I got to take a shower. I got to clean up. 
But yet, spiritually, we let it go and let it go and let it go. That's why they used to have revivals. And that's why, I pre- that's why by the way, instead of preachers, when they come to church, they say, now don't preach to me, preacher. What they were saying is, leave me alone. But when people are right with God, they come to church and they say, God, I need to hear from you. God, preach to me, preacher. And they used to want preachers to come to step on their toes. We live in a generation today that wants the leaven more than the unleavened. We want the impurity more than the purity. And it shows in our world and how little is being done for God because so few people want anybody to say, let's get rid of the leaven. Let's get rid of the impurity. Let's clean up our acts. That's what revival means, by the way. It means cleaning up things. Man, I, I wish I had time. I'm going to just give you three things here. There's In uh, Mark chapter 18, verse 14, turn there real quick, and this is the end of the road right here. We're, this is the last turn on the street. This is like one of those long country roads, though. But this is the lot. This is the last turn. You need to see this, and I need to tell you, Mark chapter number eight, verse number fourteen. When the disciples had forgotten to take bread, neither had they in the ship with them more than one loaf. And he charged them, saying, "Take heed, beware the leaven of the Pharisees, and of the leaven of Herod." And they reasoned among themselves, saying. It's because we have no bread. And when Jesus knew it, he saith unto them, Why reason ye because you have no bread? Perceive ye not yet, neither understand. Have ye your heart yet hardened? Having eyes see ye not, and having ears hear ye not? And do you not remember when I break the five loaves among five thousand? How many baskets full of fragments took ye up? They say unto him, Twelve. So Jesus saying to his disciples, He said, You don't have to have to worry about not having enough bread. He said, I've got plenty of bread. He said, it ain't plenty of bread. He said, I got plenty of my word. He said, it's not lack of word. It's not lack of preaching. He said, I, but I need you to beware of something. He said, I need you to beware of the leaven. But he didn't just say one kind of leaven. When, if, when Jesus says, he says, leaven of the Pharisees. Now, I'm going to talk to you about that real quick. But then he says, the leaven of the, which one's there? What did he say? Herod. Of Herod. Now, in uh, Matthew chapter, um, let's see here. Matthew 16, he says, Take heed and beware the leaven of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. You say, well, there's one of them contradictions in the Bible. Because everybody knows the Pharisees and the Sadducees and, the, and, and Herod, they're all three different. Well, that's right. Isn't that something? Because there's three different kinds of leaven that I want to warn us about here this morning. The leaven of the Pharisees, that's, this is the kind that everybody likes to talk about, but nobody understands. The Pharisees, they made clean the outside of the cup, but the inside was dirty. Jesus actually said to him in Matthew 23, 25 through 28, he says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! He said, For you make clean the outside of the cup and of the platter, but within they are full of extortion and excess. And he goes on. And he lets them have it. The Pharisees would make broad their phylacteries. They would actually wear Bible verses. And everybody thought, boy, you look at the Pharisees, you thought that guy's got it all together. I grew up going to church like that. And I'd go to conferences, you know, and I'd be sitting there, man. And I'd, I'd look at all those other teenagers. I'd think, man, they, 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 they got it all together. But I realized they didn't have it all together either. And sometimes I think, man, there's something wrong with me. But that's, that ought to be the attitude that we all had. There is something wrong. The reason I thought that because there was something wrong with me. We had a preacher come, and I've told this before, but for the bishop came, and he preached, man, and he preached right at me. And I came to the altar that night, and some of the people there, some of the kids said, boy, I didn't expect Travis to come tonight. I wouldn't have thought he would have come up here, but they didn't know me like I knew me, and they didn't know me like God knew me. You can fool people. But you can't fool God. And the leaven of the Pharisees was this thing of, well, we're going to fool God. We're going to fool the people. But Jesus said, you don't fool me. The leaven of the Pharisees, that's a kind of a leaven. That's kind of a wickedness and impurity that we always, as long as we, as long as we appear good, everything's good. 
They like to call us Pharisees sometimes. They like to say, well, what matters is on the inside, not what's on the outside. Man, do you know that they like to say, well, quote that verse, well, God looks on the heart, but man looks on the outward appearance. That ought to scare the fire out of us. When I hear that, that doesn't give me cause to relax and take it easy when I realize that God knows every thought of my heart. That doesn't give me a cause to say, okay, I'm, I'm okay now. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. The Pharisees genuinely thought as long as we look good, it doesn't matter how wicked we are. Boy, we get kind of guilty of that in our, in our circles sometimes. We think, well, I'm an independent Baptist and I got standards and I got all this stuff and we ought to have all those things. But we better be right on the inside. Amen. Then there's another kind of leaven. The Sadducees, they were an interesting group. They, uh, the Bible says, then came unto him in Mark chapter 12, verse 18, then came unto him the Sadducees, which say there is no resurrection. You know what that means? There's no, there's, there's no life after death. There's no resurrection. So if there's no resurrection, then guess what? There's no judgment. And if there's no judgment, then there's no accountability. And if I'm not going to stand before God someday, and yes, all my sins are forgiven, but listen, and they're all gone, but there is, there is a judgment, a, a seat of Christ, a beam, a seat of Christ, where I stand before God, and the Bible says, every idle word shall be judged. We shall give it, every man shall give an account of himself to God. Well, I tell you, I need preaching that reminds me that someday I'm going to stand before God. I can fool you, and you can fool me, but God sees it all. And someday, the Bible says he'll wipe away all tears. I wonder if what some of those tears will be the tears that we shed because of the filthiness that we allowed. Because we, act, we lived as though there was no judgment day. It's funny how, when I was on the way up here, Matt, we, we left plenty early. I made up some time on the interstate by speeding. But it's okay as long as I don't get caught, right? Because I'm not really speeding unless the police see me. And then I lost the time when I got over here because they were paving. Brother Chris sent me a message. He said they are paving and I was the car behind him. And then I stayed behind this big truck and so I had to, I had to catch up. So the speed limit down there is 55. What did you say we was going, Angelia? About 110 coming through there. She's screaming at me. Oh, that's tough. We were just having a little bit of fun on the country road. It was all fun and games unless I come around the corner and Mr. State Policeman's coming around. Boy, it would be so much more fun driving if you knew that there weren't any police around, wouldn't it? I mean, but around every corner there could be one. Man, it takes all the fun out of it. You know why? Because we don't want to have any reckoning. But wouldn't it be something if you could just live like the Sadducees? When it's over, it's over. There are people that live that way, by the way. They live as if there is no God. They live as if there is no judgment. Sadly, there are some people that don't even believe that they're going to spend eternity in hell. When you die, you just burn up. That's the leaven of the Sadducees. The sin of living as though or believing there is no recompense of reward. Then, then there's the leaven of the Herodians. And I, I don't have time to talk to you and tell you about Herod, but Herod was a wicked, vile person that married into Judaism and liked to wear the title or the, to say he was a Jew, but he was, in a, he was a Jew in name only. He was as wicked and vile as a man could be. If he wanted another man's wife, he'd just take her. If he, if he wanted multiple wives, if, if, if sometimes if he had, in a marriage, Herod would kill his own wife so that he could get someone else. He had no regard for life. He had no regard for morality. If it felt good to Herod, he just did it. You know, I see that kind of a, hair, that kind of a mentality or that kind of a leaven even entering into our Christian circles. There's not much preaching or not much thinking about holiness anymore. We're almost like the leaven of Herod has taken over. And you know what? Who are you? What do you all think? You, know, you got standards? You, you, you have morals? 
there's things you, you you don't you you don't there's there's some things you don't watch. What are you what are you talking? Who are you? I mean, there's some things you don't want to partake in. What are you, Mister Two Two Goody Sues, or what? What's wrong with you people? But I'm not talking about the world saying that because the world still knows that Christians are supposed to have some morals. But I'm talking about Christians, professed Christians, condemning other Christians that believe that there are to be some decency or holiness or morality among God's people. Man, there's some crazy stuff that goes on in the name of Jesus today. I mean, there's some wickedness and perversion that takes place. And they say, it's okay. We just want to fit in the culture. The last time I checked, our culture is about as corrupt and rotten and filthy as it could be. I mean, it was bad growing up, but it just gets worse and worse. And young people, and I, 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 could, I, I wouldn't have survived as a teenager with a thing called the Internet. I lived out in the country. Miles out in the country, and you know what? Even way out in the country, the devil saw fit to provide me a means to put defilement in my mind. You don't have to, it don't matter where you live today, defilement's everywhere. You can be as wicked as you want to be. I mean, you can learn about all manner of wickedness. You can get on the phone or the computer or sneak in there or whatever it is. And you can just look up anything and everything. Adults. And then we wonder, why isn't God using us? Why aren't we having revival? Why is our country turning to communists? Why is it that we think we've got to get this man to be president? And it doesn't matter how filthy he might be or how defiled he is, as long as he says Republican over it, but so it must be okay. Well, you know, everybody sins. And we think we're going to have revival or save our nation because we get a filthy man. Now, if we're going to have any revival, and, and I do believe, and brother, you started the church. When we start, when we do that, we go to a community and we believe we're going to reach the community and we want to reach our nation. We don't want to see our nation progressively get worse for the Chris. We don't want it to get worse. We talk about the good old days. And while we know that there was defilement in the good old days, but there was also some morality. There were some things you just didn't do. But we live in a day-to-day -day where all the sodomites running around, they don't just do their wickedness in the closet anymore. There's no such thing as coming out of the closet. Now they're in your living room, and they're just saying and flaunting it in your faces, and we wonder, is there any hope? Yeah, there's hope. It's not for us to be a little bit better than they are. It's not for us to be a little bit cleaner than they are. But it's, it's for us to... Search out all the leaven. I started to tell you this and I'm done. During the Feast of Unleavened Bread, they would go into the houses and they would search everywhere. The ladies, they would, uh, they would clean under things. And, and I remember there's a lady who used to be in our church and, and, uh, and I went to visit her and she had all these little trinkets setting up there, all these little things, you know. And she said, boy, when I was younger, she said, I'm just not like I used to be. She said, when I was younger, I used to clean every one of them every day. Can you imagine that? We can't even comprehend a world like that. When my mom and dad moved to the farm, when my mom got done cleaning the house, she'd go to the barn and sweep the barn floor. We're not like that. When I went to Chicago for the first time, I went to the streets and I looked and there was trash everywhere, litter everywhere. Not like here, every once in a while you might see garbage laying around, but I mean there it was everywhere. And I'm not throwing off on the people there. I'm just saying that the, it was an acceptable culture to just have trash everywhere. That's kind of the way our world is today. But they would search out and they would make sure because the rule was there can be no leaven. And for seven days there was no leaven anywhere. That's what we need sometimes in our lives. I believe what's what we need today It's what I need is a searching of the leaven and a time of renewal and God cleanse, clean me up God seasons like that dear heavenly father thank you for all you do for us God help us Lord Lord we could say what would be good if someone else would have heard this message but God we've been here this morning we've heard it I've heard it I'm accountable for what I've heard dear God 
Lord God, I do want you to use me. And I believe there are others here that want to be used of God. Lord, help us, dear God, to get out the leaven. And Lord God, to have time of cleansing and renewal, revival. Help us, I pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to let you finish however you'd like to do. Thank you. Let's just keep our heads bowed, our eyes closed for a moment. I made reference earlier, this preacher's referenced it a couple times. We can think about and concentrate on folks that we think this could have helped. A message like this could have helped in so many people's lives if they'd just been here to hear it. But the Lord saw fit to allow me to hear it. And the Lord saw fit to allow you to hear it. And exactly what he said earlier is true. You cannot read the Bible and you cannot hear the Bible preach without it having an effect on your heart and your life. And this morning, every one of us that are here are going to make a decision. Every one of us. We're going to, we're going to decide that, ah, oh, it's not for me. I'm not really listening and paying attention. It's not really for me. I'll be okay. It will totally disregard what we've seen and heard this morning. And some of us will make that decision. And others of us will make a decision to adhere to what we've heard. And hopefully to respond to what we've well, the piano just begins to play softly. Listen, an altar is not the only place to pray, but it's a great place to pray and give yourself to the Lord again. This so maybe this morning, you just want to come and remind the Lord that you're His. And that you desire to be pure. Maybe you need to come to Him and ask Him, as David did in the 51st Psalm, to search your heart. Search me, O God, and see if there be any wicked way in me. Listen, I want to be used of God. I don't want my life to just end someday. There are a lot of young people in this room, in this place today. Listen, don't you want your life to count for the Lord? I don't want to be that vessel that's filthy and unusable. I want to be in the, I want to be in a place of use for the Lord. Thank you for your word this morning. May it be more precious to us. Lord, I thank you for what we've been able to hear this day. And Lord, for your word as it's been preached and preached well this morning. Lord, may we not just walk away this morning from this place being grateful to have been a place where we heard a good Bible message preached. But Lord, may we walk away from this place today realizing that today we need to draw closer to you. That today this is not just a message to hear, but it's a message to act upon, to live upon. May we be challenged throughout this day and each hour of each day moving forward to seek after purity. Or may we allow your word to drive out the impurity. Lord, I thank you for this message. I thank you for this preacher. Lord, I thank you for this meeting for this morning. I pray that you'd seal in our hearts and in our minds the things we've seen and heard this day may not be quickly snatched away by the activities of life throughout this day. We thank you for it now in Jesus' name.